Hey, everybody. Robert Baltadano here. Welcome to Talks from the Heart podcast. This is going to be an exciting time for you as we discuss issues uh, that are affecting the church. We're also going to be talking about uh, relevant issues on theology as well as uh, practical Christian ministry. Pastor David, I am super excited to start this journey of podcasting with you. I've been looking forward to this. It's, uh, <clears throat> excuse my throat, I just finished my Sunday morning services, but uh, I've been looking forward to this, Robert. I I want to have more of an uh, opportunity to connect with uh, members of our fellowship and perhaps, you know, the broader uh, Christian audience. And hopefully um, these podcasts might be something that is of value and show value uh, as we answer questions, I think, that are relevant to many of the uh, Christians' concerns and things today. And uh, it's my pleasure and my blessing to be part of this. And by the way, congratulations on 35 years of faithful ministry. It's been a blessing. You know, I was sharing recently in a church service how that um, the Lord, every step of the of the way for us from when we first began our ministry back in 1981 to our present, how that God has shown himself faithful and has provided in every way. And we've seen some wonderful things take place in our ministry and in the lives of those who have been impacted. So, yeah, 35 years. And when you think about it, sometimes, you know, and I don't mean to say this in a, a loose kind of way, but there are marriages that don't last 35 years. When somebody celebrates the significance of 35 years of marriage, you know, that is really a an opportunity, a true opportunity to celebrate God's faithfulness. And in, in many ways, my wife, Marie, and I have been joined in heart and spirit to this work. And so when we consider that we have spent 35 years of our lives, you know, the entire life of one of my daughters, a good portion of the life of one of my sons, and obviously a good portion of the other two, it's been a journey that I think has been a blessing, challenging, but completely fulfilling. So yeah, thank you for remembering that. It's been a blessing. Yeah. So 35 years, I mean, you've you've seen in those 35 years, many spiritual movements, you've seen uh, cultural shifts and tragedies. And, and all of that that you've experienced, I'm sure it must have, I mean, when you look back and where we're at today versus where you were 35 years ago, it's probably a big difference. There's a tremendous difference. I came out of uh, a revival the Jesus movement as the United States experienced it was a true revival where God um, awakened uh, believers and revived believers to um, once again pursue him and to walk in the power of his spirit. And so, yes, I've seen some tremendous, tremendous uh, plus, you know, things that are on the plus Mm -hmm. side, and I've seen some tremendous things that are on the negative. Hmm. So in those 35 years, I mean, you, like you said, you've seen a lot of different things, some positive things, I'm sure some some negative things and all of that. And, you know, as we get into this this podcast, Talks from the Heart, and as, as we discuss these issues, uh, our, our first program, actually, our first podcast here is on a interesting topic that it's, I think it's affecting the church, and I'm sure you would agree with me as well. And, uh, you know, I've entitled it Cohabitation, the New Norm. And this is something that has infiltrated the church. This is something that, you know, Christians are debating with one another, unfortunately. And uh, just just to kind of give you what, what's been going on out there, I, I actually read this uh, letter this young adult, a 20-year-old, wrote to this uh, relationship um, advice person uh, or advisor, uh, counselor, and uh, she wrote him a letter because she's been dating this uh, this man and never been, she's never lived with him, but they're they're thinking about the future, but nothing has been set as far as marriage and all of that. And uh, in her letter, and I'm going to quote what she said, she put this letter to this relationship advice columnist. She said this, and I quote, I can't imagine not living with somebody before marrying them. Because in my mind, it makes sense that you need to be compatible. And living together seems like the way to really get to know whether you can make it work. Now, when I read that, I'm thinking, you know, when I buy a car, and I'm sure you do the same thing, you know, you you road test it, right? Because you want to make sure it, it, it runs well and that you like it. It seems to me that marriage, the approach of marriage among young people is kind of like a road test. What do you think? I think that when you begin to look at human relationships in a mechanical way, 
that there seems to be a logic to it that is actually, uh, it's just not practically sound. Um, God intends us to have relationship. We have a relationship with somebody that God has created that is going to fill in the gaps of my life. And uh, there may be there may be a number of people on the face of the earth that in one form or another may be able to fill in many of those gaps and and were to were I to have met them and married them, um, I could very well have had a good marriage. But there's a wisdom in waiting for that person that that really is um, in a spiritual sense the one who's going to complete me, you know. And so when you consider marriage, marriage is is a relational thing. It's not the way I relate to my car because I get rid of my car every three or four years. Mm -hmm. Marriage is a permanent institution established and ordained by God. It's one of the three initial um, established kinds of, uh, uh, what's the proper word, Um, institutions that God established within nine chapters of the book of Genesis. We know that in in Genesis in chapter 3, he he gave to us the uh, the church. We know that in Genesis chapter 9, he gave to us government. But in chapter 2, he established for us the uh, the fact of marriage. And chapter 1 also, you know, the two shall become one flesh. So marriage is ordained by God and is an institution intended for the betterment of man. And Malachi refers to it as being God's holy institution. And so, because marriage represents Christ and his bride, and the bride has made herself ready with good works, there is a picture in the New Testament especially of we being pure, spotless, prepared, because we are an evidence of a of a uh, relationship with our Creator. And so, Paul would say, that when somebody determines to have a sexual relationship with someone, he says, don't you realize that when you join yourself to, and I'll use the Old Testament, the, rather the King James, when you join yourself to a harlot, he says the two have become one flesh. He's making it very clear to us that it's not God's intent for us to just join ourselves haphazardly or even with this mentality of seeing whether it works or whether we're compatible or not. The pro- part of the problem with that is we're not, we're not valuing the essential things that will keep somebody married, like faith in Christ and the attributes of a believer that have like love and patience and endurance and, and that which gives to us the ability to create uh, means of communicating, et cetera. I mean, there's so many things that are part of it. We have a tendency of thinking, well, if we're good in bed together, if we have sexual compatibility, then it's going to work. In reality, those who have had relationships prior to marriage, who have had sexual relationships, have a, a, a greater um, a greater number of divorces because they didn't they didn't set their mind on the things that mattered. And they put their minds on the things that didn't. Mm-hmm. And so they may have built up a relationship sexually, but they still don't know each other's favorite color. They don't know anything about their families, dreams, aspirations. They don't have any understanding of how many children we should have together and things like that. Now, of course, that's generalization. Some have and to some degree said, oh, I'd like to. But no, I've discovered in, through my ministry and through life that uh, marriage is much more than just a tryout. Marriage is a all or nothing proposition. And when you get into these relationships and you say, well, I think that we ought to just give it a go and see if we can get along in the house, you can get along. There's nothing that would keep you from it. You just need to learn each other's habits, and that's part of communication. And in dating, when you have a dating relationship, you begin to pick those things up anyway. I mean, as a man, if I go to pick up the woman and I walk into the home and I see that she doesn't really put a high priority in cleaning the home, I'm not going to assume that she's going to do that when we get married. Mm-hmm. If I walk in, she doesn't like to cook you know, and do the things that I think that are part of being my wife. She doesn't like to cook or if she's argumentative or those things don't change when we get married. So by making living together as the trial, I think the problem with doing something like that is you're you're eliminating the things that really matter and focusing your attention on things that are not that important. Plus, you're entering into violation of God's commands as it pertains to 
to uh, fornication for sexual sin that God says, let no one be deceived because of these things. He's, the wrath of God abides in those who don't follow him. And so it's a greater issue than simply trying it out. And I think that a lot of the younger people today, because they came from broken homes, because they're longing for a relationship, and because of all those social things, they're putting the living together in a category to almost justify, that. well, it does, it justifies their sexual sin. I expect the world to live in such a fashion. They don't have Christ, and they don't have his word. But, but God does not expect his children to disregard his word in that fashion and violate his commands. And many times these who come from uh, those who are believers who go into these kind of relationships are coming from churches that don't teach the whole counsel of God. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I've read, too, uh, as far as arguments against this, you know, Christians that are trying to justify this whole thing is, you know, marriage licenses did not come around till the 1500s. This is something I actually read recently. And so were those before that in sin living together? I mean, in other words, you know where they're going with it. It's like, okay, well, if we need that certificate to, to be considered legal and before the Lord right, well, what about those beforehand? And then I think one one person said, well, was Abraham and Sarah in sin because they lived together? Was, you know, and they go on and on and on. I mean, what would you say to that? I think that we can justify sin with all kinds of interesting arguments. You know, um, in the beginning, God brought Eve to the man and the two became one flesh. And uh, theologians of all ages from all time has been pointing out that that was the institution of marriage. So yes, on the one hand, you have God who is the officiator over that. He's the first, if you will, the first pastor overseeing this, and God brought the two together. But at the same time, Romans 13 make it very clear that we're supposed to be living under the directives of the law. And the law that we live in gives to us an understanding of the legal ramifications of that. So on the one hand, I could say, yeah, I can cohabit. We're going to stay together. God brought us together and and all of that. Well, that may have been true in the 1500s, but here in the United States in the 21st century, and it's been this way since the beginning, uh, we have laws that regulate that because in the United States, marriage is not simply a recognition of the two becoming one, but it's also a legal document. And so we have to take into consideration the violation of the law, and the law states this. And thus, I believe on the one hand, if uh, I'm on some island and there are, there's no law to that, well, of course, you know, uh, this is how they do it here, you know, or they do it in this land. I understand that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, here in the United States, there are laws and rules that regulate that. And as Christians, we're under the law, and thus we ought to abide by it. Mm-hmm. Now, you're doing something very interesting in August, and I've never, ever have seen this in any church, you know, and I know I've, I've been part of this fellowship here since 1994, and uh, but just in my knowledge of other pastor friends and all, but you're actually, you, you, you basically announce that if you're living together, you know, we want to make things right. You know, you want to make things right before the Lord, so we're going to do a, a wedding, and you, you know, we're going to provide the church and all of this stuff. Talk a little bit about that, because that, that's very, very unique. I, I've never ever have seen a pastor do this? Well, you know, we're aware of how the culture has Mm -hmm. infected the church. We're aware of that. And we're also aware of what Scripture says. You know, ultimately, the church is brought under uh, what is called church discipline. Mm -hmm. And so somebody who professes to be a believer in Christ and who professes that this is their home church, they are automatically, biblically, under the discipline of this church. I, as a pastor... I have a responsibility of of uh, governing this church according to Scripture. And so it came to my attention that in our fellowship, there's more than one who is professing faith in Christ, who is just continuing to live in sin. And, and I began to be aware of that and began to be concerned about that because Paul would say a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Mm-hmm. And so if if we do not act on what we know, then I think we give sin a toehold in the church. And so we began to consider that and all and and made the decision that we would um, confront the issue by mm-hmm. making announcements, encourage the people in the church who are living in such a way to um, to get right before God. 
because living together in this church constitutes fornication, and we don't want that leaven to permeate. It, it, it is something for their blessing, and it is something that will help to purify the church from, uh, from sins that have become entrenched. And so we've made the announcement. We're doing counseling with some couples right now, preparing for that date that will take place uh, in the near future. And, uh, and it's our prayer that we'll be able to help these people to live in such a way that honors the Scripture as it pertains to, to abiding by the law of the land and, and no longer fornicating mm-hmm. because they're in, the, they're in the state of fornication mm-hmm. right now. Yeah, it's interesting because it's it's a bad example. Cohabitation is a bad example. Absolutely. I mean, you're you're showing something. And I remember when I was in upstate New York pastoring, uh, a young couple came to the church. You know, you're always excited when you have new people coming in, and especially when they want to serve, right? You want young people to serve and all of that. So I remember I was excited, you know, and I got to know them a little more. And, and I noticed that, you know, they would come in together, they would leave together, which didn't think of anything. You know, they weren't married. I knew that. And uh, through a conversation, find out that uh, they were living together and they weren't married. And that kind of was just like a jab to me. I was like, oh boy, now mm-hmm. I, I have to confront it because mm-hmm. I can't just allow them just to hang out, especially if they want to serve. And so, you know, when you see this, even in the church, like you're saying, even with the announcement you made, I like what you said. You're, you're, you're actually, you're, you're not ignorant of the culture. You, you, you understand what is going on outside the walls of this church. And unfortunately, with a church like this size, you do have people, even the size that I had, it wasn't a big church, but yet you still have that affecting the church. And the way you're dealing with it, I think is very wise. It's pretty interesting because, you know, you're not only getting them right before the Lord, but but they're doing something right legally. And, mm-hmm. I, and I think when you're talking about all these different things about the example that people set, you don't want to have that appearance in the church because then all of a sudden, then you're going to have other people say, well, they're doing it. Why, why can't we? I believe that sin spreads, just like like Paul said, you know, a little leaven mm-hmm. doesn't take a large amount for it to spread throughout the church, and it undermines the um, the ministry credibility. Mm-hmm. It certainly undermines the authority of the pastor, mm-hmm. because when, when you confront this and they just say, oh, it doesn't matter, there's a ton of other people doing this, you've never responded to them, why are you responding to me? Mm. It's just one of those ways that we're able to say, you know, we, as a church, we want to live according mm-hmm. to what the Word of the Lord says, and and we definitely want to remedy this situation because it's very blatant. This mm-hmm. is very obvious. This is one of those things that is repeated both in the Old and the New Testament that we are not to be unequally mm-hmm. yoked or that we're not to be con- um, conducting ourselves in a, in a uh, relationship that yeah. is fornicative, yeah. obviously. What would you say, though, and I've had this said to me before, I'm going to make sure that I'm in another room and they will stay in another room. I mean... When, when somebody comes to you genuinely and says, listen, I don't have the money to, to just go find a place on my own, but, but, but I'm going to just sleep in my own room and then I'll have her sleep in her, her own room. And can that work? You know, one of the things that I've, I've heard that obviously over the years on one occasion or another, uh, I've often been puzzled by that. I've thought, well, <laughs> why don't you just go to the JP? Why don't you go right. to the Justice of the Peace, get married? Why are you wanting to remain in that relationship? So there must be something else going on mm-hmm. that needs to be dealt with while I'm still married to somebody else. Well, now you've got even a bigger problem. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. that's where the conversation begins to go. Yeah. Because my first response would be, listen, if you know it's wrong, why are you continuing? And if you know that it's wrong and are still continuing, why are you continuing is a good question for us to deal with because it may be that they, well, I'll give you some examples. One is they're not free to marry. Mm -hmm. Two, well, it's because we want a big wedding. Now, let me see if I get this right. You've been living together for six years. You've got three kids, but you want to wear white. It, It doesn't make sense. Why don't you just go get married and then have a, a reception and celebration and be a testimony to your family instead of needing a party. So there are a lot of things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've seen it, Robert. I've seen it mm-hmm. where the the reasoning is, and I've heard this one too, well, we're saving up money for a big wedding. Mm-hmm. No, your sin has become more important, you know, so that you can go out and have a big party. Mm-hmm. You need to You need to forsake your sin, get married, do it the right way and watch God honor you because mm-hmm. they, they don't understand the blessings of God. And part of the reason may be because they have been quenching the spirit. Mm-hmm. They don't even know that God's blessings have, have not been really on them the way he wants to bless them. Mm-hmm. 
because they're not forsaking a known sin. Now, going back to Scripture, because, I mean, that's one of the things that, obviously, you're not going to find in the Bible, you cannot live together. You know, that's everybody always goes to that. Well, show me in the Bible where, right? But you did mention something, and I'm going to repeat, 2 Timothy 2.22. I think it's a verse that I've used. I'm sure you have as well. But it says, flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. So flee also youthful lust. Talk a little bit about that. what that means. To flee youthful lust, there's a couple of ways that you approach that. One is there are there are there there is a temptation sometimes with younger people, like Paul speaking to Timothy, so we'll speak from a man to a man, there is a temptation to, sometimes to prolong childhood. So instead of growing up by going through a variety of things that will make you a man, purging you from childish behaviors and childish views, you know, as a minister, Timothy needed to flee the temptation to remain young, relevant perhaps, and cool, if you will, and he needed to grow into maturity. So that's one thing. The second way to approach that is the the lusts that are associated with youth, which is pride and arrogance, uh, an overbearing attitude, competitive spirit. And so there are certain sins that are are part of a young man's disposition that if you're going to be a spiritual leader, you need to forsake and remove yourself from that. So in context, Paul would be saying to Timothy, you are a pastor, and as a pastor, if you're going to have an impact, you need to cease being a child, put away childish things, and you need to pursue the things that make for a mature believer in Christ. And as a pastor, especially, you need to evidence those things in your manner of life. Flee youthful lusts, but pursue these other things that make for a demonstration of spiritual maturity. So in its context, Paul would be saying to Timothy, you need to refrain from the things that are characteristic of a young man, and you need to look to become the model of a of a, a man of God, you know, you need to be in conduct and in spirit and faith and and in love and purity and and all of that. That's what you're supposed to be because you're a pastor. So you need to get past the childish things where you have the temptation to be the cool guy. Today it would be the guy who has to wear the skinny jeans mm-hmm. and have the muscle shirts and and to talk cool while he's wearing you know, cool clothes and chewing his gum and and having the swoopy hairstyle, whatever <laughs> it may be, you know, you have to get away from that. Yeah. Because the young young people are not looking for a cool friend. Mm-hmm. When young people come to church, Paul would be saying they're looking for a mature man who can help them to mm-hmm. be sober minded and to grow in their faith and understand the deeper things of God. So Timothy, stay away from all of those activities of the flesh that will disqualify you from being a good example to the flock. And, and I want to go back to the, some of the uh, facts that you were mentioning at the beginning of our talk here, uh, th- that not many really uh, understand or realize what, what they're getting themselves into when, when they start living together before marriage. And I kind of did a little research on that and just kind of t- to go back to that so those of you listening can understand. But I, I found out that living together is considered to be more stressful than being married. Uh, another another statistic is just over fifty percent of the fir- of first cohabit- uh, cohabiting couples ever get married. So so you think about these things. So I'm going to try it out, but like you were saying, you know, th- sometimes it doesn't even happen. They don't even get married because they're looking at it as a car, right? You go and test drive it. Uh, it's not working out well, or I, I want to try something else, and they're hopping from relationship to relationship. So this whole ca- cohabitation has these false promises, these empty promises. They're not they're not anything that that I think it's stable. I think that part of what I'm seeing now from, <clears throat> excuse me, a generation, uh, you know, an older generation versus what I'm seeing with mm-hmm. the younger people, I really believe that part of what has caused the cohabitation craze to become endemic in our society is they don't count the cost of, you know, the unwanted pregnancies, if you will, the children that are being born to multiple fathers, sometimes through fornication mm-hmm. in one relationship to another. They're not counting the cost, the, 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 the cost to children and the cost to themselves. They just don't count the cost. Part of it, I would say, is because the members of the church who made their vows to God to remain married and then at a certain point decided those vows were not as important as my, my personal happiness or fulfillment— mm-hmm. 
and thus we break our vows in marriage and leave behind a broken family with a bunch of children with broken hearts. Well, those children, you know, know that their mom and dad made vows to God and they were getting they got married in the church. And I've heard the story, so have you, where they'll say, Well, my dad used to be a pastor, or my dad used to serve, you know, on the board, or my dad was a Sunday school teacher, or my mom used to and they talk about what they did as they grew up, but they didn't remain together. And what happens even in the Christian home is the kid says, I you know, God's grace is sufficient and uh, if I get a, a divorce, well, my mom and dad did, and they survived. We can survive. Our kids will survive. And they don't see the damage that's been done to them. I, I've, I know too many who, when you say to them, but your life has been damaged by this. Well, I survived, so will they. Mm-hmm. That's kind of their attitude. But it's not a matter of survival, is it? It's a matter of thriving. Mm-hmm. I don't want my children to survive. I want them to thrive. And the way they're going to thrive is by having a dad and a mom in the home that through thick and thin, through hard times and the good times, have remained faithful to the vows we made to God first. And that's the thing that concerns me. It's not that I expect the world to live by godly standards. You know, there was a time when laws were in such opposition to divorce that it was not easy to get it. And you had to wait for quite some time. So the laws were in favor of marriages remaining intact for the obvious reasons. And then the church, the church had a strong voice in the lives of people, just the teachings of the church. And then you had friends and you had family. All were pulling for you to make it. But today, there, there's not that, that, it's not that strong. Government has made it easier to divorce, a no-fault divorce. Family will say, well, if you're not happy, you might as well get out of it. Mm-hmm. And the church doesn't want to encourage, not all the church, but some places in the church do not teach that, that divorce is not something God intends. And stick it out and watch what God can do. We have such a tendency, I think, to be permissive in so many ways that we have undermined uh, what marriage really is. Mm. As we come to the end of this uh, theme or this topic that we have today, Pastor David, somebody's watching us right now or listening to us as they're driving, and uh, they're in that situation. They're, they're living together, they're born-again Christians, and perhaps they're convicted now. What would you say to them? I would say that if God is speaking to your heart and you know you're in sin, confess your sin and forsake it. Repent and go to that one whom you are living with and say, we need to get this right before the Lord. And if you're free to marry, you have the capacity to marry, then go get married. Make it right before the Lord. I would also encourage you to go to your pastor or to one of the elders in your church, one of the leaders, sit down with them, have a conversation, and work it out so that you're going in the right direction with some encouragement and accountability. But it isn't something for you to just say, well, I'll look at this later. The Holy Spirit's speaking to you now, and because he's speaking to you now, you need to act now. Well, Pastor David, it's been great. Our first podcast in the can for a good topic that we've been discussing. This is something that is obviously relevant, and it's affecting the church as we've been discussing, uh, that we actually have to have these debates with Christians, which is kind of sad, you know, because these are things that should should really be black or white. You know, they should be like, okay, like you were saying, you know, it's like you're you're setting a bad example, you you know, there's you know, promiscuity written all over it if you're living together. Because I always think, you know, if you're living together, unless you have no hormones, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, you just, you just can't. You can't do that. You know, mm-hmm. there's temptations that like we were talking about. So uh, with, with all that said, I think it's important that everyone stays close to the Lord and his word. And like you were mentioning earlier, is to, to, to really uphold the, the word of God, right? Because that's something that is really lacking right now. Yeah. Amen. Well, you know, here's the thing. I'll give you two examples as we're about to close you know, the first miracle that is recorded in the Gospel of John was, was performed at a wedding. So for the, for the individual to say, well, they didn't have um, formal weddings the way that we have now and this and that, you need to know that, that during the time of Christ, they did have weddings. Jesus performed his wedding at, in Cana at that, at that marriage, and he in, obviously was there to bless the couple that were getting married that day. So there has always been, biblically, you know, rites, certain kinds of uh, ceremonies that justified the uh, relationship of a man and a woman to be together, living under the same roof, and producing children, always have. 
You know, that's what made it so phenomenal when Joseph had in his mind to divorce his uh, his betrothed wife, Mary, because in the Jewish custom of that day, the betrothal was equivalent to a marriage ceremony with the exception of physical intimacy. That came on the marriage night. And so we know that in the new as well as the old, that there were certain kinds of uh, ceremonies that were involved in the joining of two to become the one flesh. We also know that Jesus was speaking to a woman at the well and said, come and bring your husband to me. She said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, in this you have spoken truly. You have had five, and the one you have now is not your husband, Mm -hmm. which is an allusion, I would say, to the fact that she was in a sexual relationship with a man she was not Mm. married to. And so Jesus pointed that out. And in that, brought her to conviction because she was in a cohabitating relationship, it would seem. The one you have now is not your husband. It would seem she was at least having sexual relations with him because Jesus pointed it out, which caused her to say, indeed, you're a prophet. How did you know this? And that's why she later on went and spoke to the men and said, come in here, a man who's told me everything I've ever done. Mm -hmm. So Jesus obviously did not bless her relationship. He obviously didn't. And so for those who would argue and say, well, marriage didn't come about until such and so time. uh, No, marriage has always existed in one form or another. It is any cultural anthropologist can tell you it's what is called a universal. Every society has marriage ceremonies of one form or another. Every society does. There's a way to justify living together. And though there may not be a Protestant pastor there performing this with signing certain documents, that society knows that that woman is that man's wife. They all know that because that is in, in, ingrained in every human being. There is a justifiable living together as husband and wife in every culture. But the Christian church of all should have known, mm-hmm. the be- known better than to start justifying fornication because Paul said that that is a sin that leads to eternal separation from God. We are we are given the commission to teach the truth and not to water it down because it offends some sensitive hearer, and they don't want to hear that. Uh, we want to thank you for tuning in. And not only that, but uh, if you want to have more engaging conversation with Pastor David, Pastor David is on social media. He's on Instagram as well as on Facebook. And if you have any other questions, I'm also on, on social media as well, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And uh, we can you know respond to you as well from this uh, topic that we discussed today. So once again, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you later. If you'd like to learn more about David Rosales, you can visit his website at calvaryccv.org. If you have any questions about today's podcast, feel free to send an email to talk at calvaryccv.org. Thanks for listening and have a great day.